Man, we have waited a long time for Hellblade 2. It's been seven years since the first game, Hellblade Senua's Sacrifice, came out all the way back in 2017. And what an absolute marvel of an achievement that game was, coming from a smaller development studio like Ninja Theory. There's a studio that aptly labels itself as Indie AAA. The fidelity and production value of their games do evoke AAA, but creatively they pursue what feel like more deeply personal passion projects. This is not a team of thousands or hundreds even, it's a team of dozens, which does not afford them the luxury of creating games on the vast scale of mega, high-budget, open-world blockbuster AAA games, but it does give them a focus and unique identity as developers that has been cultivated and nurtured over their many years. The results they managed to achieve with Hellblade 1, which only had around 20 people working on it, made me think, imagine what they could accomplish in the future. Not one soul more would suffer as he had. Well, fast forward to today and I no longer have to imagine, having finished through an early review copy provided by Xbox, the sequel, Senua Saga Hellblade 2, which was developed by around 80 people, quadruple the manpower of the first game, but it's still a smaller sized team. What they've crafted here with Hellblade 2 can only be best described as a work of art, a most sincere labor of love and creative drive. Now, it is important to keep the label of indie AAA in mind. This is not your dozens to hundreds of hours long open world epic with tons of quests to complete, NPCs to talk with, and dungeons to explore off the beaten path. If anything, Hellblade 2 is the complete antithesis of that. It's very tight and contained, it's as linear as a game can be, and in turn, it allowed them to ensure every little piece of it is meticulously handcrafted from top to bottom and from start to finish. They didn't take Hellblade and scale it up tenfold for the sequel, they instead decided to do more of what Hellblade 1 did at higher fidelity, taking all of their learnings to just make an even more memorable experience. Now I managed to finish Hellblade 2 in around 7 hours and that number may raise immediate red flags for some, but this runtime was already something that was disclosed beforehand and Ninja Theory and Xbox smartly decided to sell this game at a cheaper price point of $50 instead of the modern day standard of $70, though I do think it's a damn shame that the game is not for some reason sold physically, it's a digital only release. It is also worth considering for me at least that it's not just the quantity of hours that make a game, but the quality of those hours. I've played games that are technically dozens to hundreds of hours long, but each of those hours were so tedious, grueling, and insufferable that I did not find value in those hours and would not have paid full price for them. And then I've played games that are maybe a dozen hours, less even, where each of those hours were so engaging, so immersive, impactful, affecting, and or fun that I felt every penny was worth it. I think of a game like Inside, which was $20 for a roughly three hours campaign, but those were three great and gripping hours that I did not regret one bit. It's up to you to decide whether paying $50 for a roughly seven to eight hours long experience is worth it, but what I can tell you is that these are seven very high quality, art housey hours. There's no fat here, it's just a really nice, lean, seven ounce piece of filet mignon where every bite is chef's kiss. It is an expensive piece of steak for its size, or probably bigger cuts that are more filling and offer better value if that's what you're looking for. But if you just want like a really nice, high quality cut of filet mignon that they finely cooked, seasoned, crafted, and perfected with exacting scrutiny, you'll get that. The most striking thing about Hellblade 2 is undoubtedly its presentation. I'd go as far as to say that it is the game's crowning achievement. I mean, just look at these graphics. This is running on an Xbox Series X, by the way. I'm not exaggerating when I say that I've not been this impressed by a game's visual fidelity since the Matrix Unreal Engine 5 tech demo. Except this, folks, isn't a tech demo, it's a full-ass video game that looks like this during gameplay. It's all rendered in real time from gameplay to cutscenes with impressively seamless transitions in between. You'd be hard-pressed to believe that it's all real time on occasions because it just looks so insanely good. Hellblade 2 maintains the appearance of a single long shot from start to finish and throughout, I'd say 99% of it, it's one of the best looking games I've ever seen. It has taken us a while to start shipping games whose graphics truly feel next gen, but it feels like we're finally getting there and there's no better exhibit than Hellblade 2. Now on Xbox, the game does only run at 30 frames per second, and while the option of a performance mode would have been welcome, 
I will say that I found no issues playing the game like this. It's a very smooth and consistent feeling 30 FPS, with only very few noticeable micro stutters during more graphics intensive sequences or more ambitious scene transitions. The developer said that they made a conscious choice to keep it 30 FPS on Xbox and not offer a performance mode because it gives the game more consistently filmic look all while being able to squeeze out the most visual fidelity possible from the Xbox consoles, with presentation being such a huge part of this particular game. Now, if you get the game on PC, which I did try out, the frame rate will go as far as your hardware will allow. In my experience, the PC version ran pretty much flawlessly, just great optimization, achieving frame rates that at max settings with DLSS and frame generation turned on, consistently set at an average of 120 frames per second at an ultra wide resolution of 3440 by 1440 with an RTX 4090 GPU. But with how much the game focuses on presentation and how little negative impact the lower 30 FPS had on my gameplay experience, I don't feel like Xbox players are getting shortchanged. It's still gonna be a very good experience and it's gonna look damn freaking good. Still, I think it's always nice when players have the choice, but it's not hugely detrimental to Hellblade 2 specifically. Hellblade's style and pace of gameplay doesn't demand 60 frames per second, but if you do want that higher frame rate, definitely get it on PC. You'll definitely get that experience there. Now, beyond fidelity, the art direction and how it leverages next-gen graphics to create some truly astonishing and mesmerizing Icelandic vistas, landscapes, and environments, alongside some of the best lighting and particle effects I've ever seen, as well as fantastical, ethereal, haunting, and disturbing scenery and sequences, paired with some jaw-dropping and astounding set pieces to tell its story, deserve immense commendation. It's all truly masterclass-level stuff, elevated further by the immaculate cinematography, from grand pan, zooms, close close-ups, angles, and compositions, to all the little subtle movements and shakes that give the camera a sense of being operated by a real person and existing in a real physical space, which further adds to the realism and immersion. And speaking of immersion, there's a complete absence of a HUD here. At times, the line between gameplay and cutscene felt so blurred that I put my controller down thinking I'd be enjoying a cinematic until I realized the character was doing nothing and required my input. Even just walking around and rotating the camera during gameplay can be astonishing to behold. I consistently couldn't believe I was controlling and moving a character in a virtual space that looked and felt so lifelike. I was just constantly marveling at the technological and artistic prowess on display. Characters are also brought to life spectacularly through a combination of insane levels of character model fidelity and phenomenal use of performance capture that yield very real looking and behaving people, which is key to such a character driven story. Under the right conditions, some of the real time cutscenes can look like stylized live action scenes. Even things like idle animations blew me away at times. I spent several minutes watching this one character contemplatively carving out a wooden doll at one point during my playthrough. I was just mesmerized by how present he looked. All this is complemented by the game's incredible score and sound design, without which the game's atmosphere and intent would have nowhere near the same effect. You will never understand this power. Something is coming.
I know I've gushed a lot about the game's presentation, but it is a very presentation-driven game. That's not to say that there is no gameplay, but it's just not the driving force of this experience. There is combat in this game that feels noticeably improved from the last entry with encounters that can offer a bit of a challenge, but from a purely mechanical standpoint, it's a pretty simple affair involving few variations of light and heavy attacks, blocks, dodges, parries, and a bullet time ability. You won't be learning and developing crazy combos, leveling up, distributing attribute points, unlocking new skills, sorting through items and equipment, or partaking in an intricate progression system like, say, God of War. At the same time, the combat mechanics are engaging enough for the game's shorter run, and the way combat is so cinematically presented makes every encounter really exciting and riveting to behold, makes every one of them count. There is puzzle solving with more variety than what the first game offered. While some of the puzzles are the familiar perspective-based symbol finding affair, there are some new puzzle types that involve activating environment-altering elements and require a bit of ingenuity. But these puzzles do overall feel pretty rudimentary, they don't offer a whole lot of challenge, and their concepts aren't pushed as far as I'd like. At the same time, though, their visual and auditory splendor and the narrative elements infused in them still make them interesting to engage with. There is navigation and a bit of exploration and discovery in this game in the form of forks along the main road that may lead to discoveries like magical structures that serve as audio log collectibles. But the vast majority of the time, you will be walking in a predetermined path with little room for deviation. At the same time, though, navigation is still compelling because existing in this setting and just looking around at the vistas they've crafted here can be so captivating in its own right. I found myself trekking onwards with consistent anticipation for where the game will take me next and what it will show me next. So yeah, Hellblade 2 is not about intricate gameplay, it's about utilizing gameplay fundamentals to take players on an interactive journey that has something very specific to say, and has very specific things to show, and very specific things it wants to evoke. This is not the kind of game where you are the director of your own journey, it's a game where the director takes you on theirs because they want to share something with you. And to that end, every hour and every detail of this experience was meticulously combed over. As for what this game's journey is, well, it's in the title. It's very much focused on Senua's personal journey. It's Senua's saga, with a plot aiming to service the game's character arcs. The plot begins with Senua boarding a Viking ship as a slave to seek revenge against the Viking raiders who ravaged her homeland before discovering that much of the conflicts and afflictions within the Viking lands, within this Icelandic space, can be traced to the mysterious presence of giants. I won't say much more than that as to avoid spoiling anything, but it's worth highlighting that the plot, while it is there, is secondary to the focus on developing Senua as a character, with the game further exploring her psychosis, the voices in her heads, the inner demons she's fighting, the war within herself, and the way these elements literally manifest at times, often in ways that make the game's presentation shine. Hellblade 2 also doubles down on its unique use of inner voices that are ever-present throughout the game, serving as narrative devices, as immersive and atmospheric elements, and at times as subtle guides for the player. New to Hellblade 2 is the introduction of an ensemble cast who will primarily serve as companions. Though they don't contribute to gameplay necessarily, they'll walk alongside you, offer some exposition and narrative beats, and guide you towards your next destination, but you won't get to control them mid-combat or anything like that, like, say, Atreus from God of War. They do serve important narrative purposes, though, and play into Senua's personal journey throughout the course of the campaign, and some of those characters do have arcs of their own, even if their presence can can feel a bit short-lived within the shorter run of this game. I am curious to see how people feel about the game's story when credits roll. The way it concludes was definitely a lot more abrupt than I anticipated in a way that may not satisfy folks seeking more definitive plot resolution, but the game does strive to offer a hopeful message amidst its dark motifs, namely about self-acceptance and self-love that may resonate with its audience. Senua's Saga Hellblade 2 is undoubtedly one of the most fascinating, mesmerizing, and refreshing gaming experiences I've had, one that emphasizes density over volume. Despite its shorter runtime, I could feel how much the team poured into making each of those hours count and feel substantial. This game feels like the definition of an experience. It's an interactive ride that takes full advantage of the unique benefits offered by the medium of video games to present a thoughtfully conceived piece of art and expression. 
with production value that matches AAA quality. But to get that quality with this size of a team, they had to make sort of a shorter, more contained experience. But it's one that I'm glad exists. I'm, I'm glad to have played through it. It feels like its own little special thing. But with all that said, the consideration of this still being seven to eight hours long and that people might want more out of a $50 game is worth emphasizing. For some, no matter how fascinating these seven hours might be, $50 might still be too big of an asking price for this runtime. Beating the game does unlock new narrators you can replay the campaign with, new voices and Senua's head from other characters that might offer new insight, but for the most part, there's not much in the way of replayability here, especially with a lack of gameplay depth and variance. With that said, I still believe Ninja Theory have crafted something really unique and special here and have triumphed in what they try to achieve. And I, for one, love to see developers bucking trends, following their heart, making something that they really want to make and pushing artistic and technological boundaries to that end. Hellblade 2 was just a wild ride from start to finish and one that had its hooks in me all the way through. Senos, would you give your life for these outsiders? In my darkest hour, it was an outsider who saved me.